Throughout the island world of the Pacific, scattered men of many European races and from almost every grade of society carry activity and disseminate disease. Some prosper, some vegetate. Some have mounted the steps of thrones and owned islands and navies. Others must again marry for a livelihood. A strapping, merry, chocolate-coloured dame supports them in sheer idleness. And dressed like natives, but still retaining some foreign element of gait or attitude, still perhaps with some relic, such as a single eyeglass of the officer and gentleman, they sprawl in palm-leaf verandas and entertain an island audience with memoirs of the music hall. And there are still others less pliable, less capable, less fortunate, perhaps less base, who continue, even in these isles of plenty, to lack bread. At the far end of the town of Papit, three such men were seated on the bench under a purau tree. I don't think I ever wanted to be anything other than an artist. I don't remember wanting to be anything else except uh, a rock musician like all teenagers. Um, in my early teens, and in fact we made a few attempts of making rock bands, but I was absolutely hopeless at that, no talent there. So after that, kind of in my late teens, I, I just drifted towards art. Before that I had a kind of idea that painters or being a painter was something that old people did. You know, it wasn't cool like being in a rock band. So, but I drifted towards that and by my late teens I decided I wanted to be an artist, so I studied painting and sculpture in Spain, then I studied theatre design in London at the Slade School. And um, in, in, this is an MFA in theatre design, and they'd give you a book or they'd give you a piece of music, and they'd say, okay, do something visual for this. And this just kind of fitted straight into my mentality. And that's been the way I've been working. I get a piece of music, I get a piece of literature that, I'm, that suddenly catches my attention and I research, I start looking into it and then I start to translate. I think this idea of translating is quite, kind of makes sense with my, with my life and with being bilingual and thinking and uh, living in two languages. So I translate things that are in, in a book, I'll try to translate them into painting or sculpture or a piece of music. And this is the way I work. In this case, I'm kind of working a bit like an illustrator in the sense that I'm getting certain moments of the book which I found really interesting. But then I want to transcend the actual image. I start off with an image like a guy in a, in a dinghy boat rowing for shore. But then I want to transcend that with the language of painting. See, the, for me the language of painting is about poetry and music. It's not just about creating an illusion of of an image of something that's going on or a landscape or a person or whatever but actually using the way it's painted to create a feeling that's related to the image that you're painting you can recognize what's going on like there's a boat or there's a there's a, a beach scene with some palm trees and that but it's painted in a strange way that's trying to use the, the actual language of painting to, to make you get the feeling of what you want to portray and that I want to transmit not by illustrating what's going on, but by the way I'm using the paint. Visual languages I find are really difficult to say something in an explicit way, but they're very effective for creating feelings in the viewer. And this is what I find interesting in painting, what I'm always looking for, is the poetry and, and the musicality as, as part of the language. My dad bought me a copy of Stevenson's Treasure Island when I was a child. Must have been eight, nine years old. I remember I was fascinated by it. I loved it. I read it over and over again, like Jim Hawkins and Long John Silver. It's all part of my childhood. So a couple of years back, I wanted to do the same thing with my children. So I bought this like standard copy of uh, Treasure Island. Uh, my children didn't seem to be as fascinated as I was when I was a kid. And the uh, thing is, um, quite by chance, it happens to include another story, and, uh, which is the ebb tide. So one summer afternoon I had nothing better to do. 
I started to read the ebb tide and uh, thinking it was going to be something similar to Treasure Island and it's also a ship and the, an island and the South Seas and everything. I started reading and all of a sudden I was hit by this story which is definitely not an adventure story for children. It's something completely different. It's, it's like it's humanity and it, at its worst. Three white men on the beach in Papete, living down and out, actually literally living on the beach. Each one of them with a pathetic story behind them of, that's brought them to this terrible situation. One of them happens to be a ship's captain who's responsible for the death of many people because he's a drunkard. And he's offered to continue the journey of this schooner that's come into port after losing most of its crew the, 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 who have died of smallpox. Uh, this guy, Davis, he accepts the job and he brings along his friends, Jewish and Herrick, with the plan to steal the ship's cargo of champagne and then sell it together with the ship, with the vessel in Peru. Once they set sail, they spend most of the time drunk until they realize that they're, they are actually victims of a fraud because the cargo of champagne is actually bottles of water. So in, in the middle of this crisis, they sight an unmapped island and there they discover this guy called Atwater who's an Englishman who's harvesting pearls. And he's also a religious fanatic. So the three of them devise a new plan, which is to kill Atwater, take his pearls. But this guy Atwater is immediately suspicious of their intentions. And he ends up killing Hewish and converting Davis. Herrick, nonetheless, is left in some kind of nihilistic limbo. You, you never know actually what he's thinking or what his plans are. So by the time I realised that this book was about, about colonialism in itself, I had that moment that's happened to me many times before, like with, with music and with literature. This is going to be one of those things I'm going to do a project about. I've been a Stevenson reader and lover since I was a kid, but I'd yeah. never read this uh, Stevenson's latest novels, right, like so. The Beach of Phallisa and, yeah. uh, and The Ebb Tide. And I did this a couple of years back and I was hit by something completely different. Yeah. And, uh, and so since then I've been on a quest to find out uh, what The Ebb Tide is really about. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is a difficult one like that. Uh, I think the question uh, is unanswerable okay. uh, in a way because Stevenson, it's offering you possibilities of uh, meanings but uh, no final one. It's a bit like a, a visual art, you see. I mean, vis work of visual art doesn't have a sort of meaning you can express in a sentence. Absolutely, uh, yeah. yeah. So if, if I offered you a sort of uh, an interpretation 
uh, of it. It would really be undermining his whole artistic project, I think. Okay. That's a way of not answering. You see. That, that, that's, a, that's a way of answering. So, it, so what you're saying is that it's just offering kind of uh, reality bites. Of a, of a new, uh, no, no it's, it's offering sort of uh, the insoluble puzzle of life, really, a moral problem. I think people, I wanted to arrange the world in dichotomies, positive, yeah. negative, good, bad, male, female, alive, dead, you know, all these, these dichotomies. And uh, so we're always trying to do that. Uh, and that's what, as you get into that last part of the, the book, you're trying to sort of sort it out. But then he just uh, kind of takes the carpet away from under your feet and makes it difficult for you. You you can't you can't say that Atwood is positive and virtuous and the, the answer. You know he yeah. isn't. Yes. Um, well, this is a key question, of course. Um, I think the peptide is somehow um, related with. Um, um, Treasure Island in the sense that it begins perhaps or opens um, at the moment when um, Treasure Island ends in a sense. I, uh, what I have in mind is the image of the three uh, maroons uh, begging for God's grace or mercy and uh, as you know at the end of Treasure Island this mercy is um, denied. They are left to to perish probably on, on the uh, desert island mm -hmm. and in a sense uh, the Eptide opens on the similar image of the three uh, beachcombers being um, left stranded on the, um, the beach of Tahiti. Okay. Um, and, of course, as you know, they embark on a rather uh, wild goose um, chase or adventure. Mm -hmm. um, they have this cargo of champagne, which yeah. uh, work as some sort of um, treasure. Mm -hmm. So we have the reworking of the treasure motif in both cases, in both novels. Do you think the Tide could be considered as uh, a, an expression of a change in political thought at the end of Stevenson's life, after having travelled to the South Seas? I don't know if it is a real change um, uh, uh, as far as Stevenson's uh, attitude towards uh, colonialism, for instance, is, uh, is concerned. I think his final um, stance uh, his political stance at the end of his life is obviously critical of uh, European uh, rule, which uh, tends, as he, as he puts it, to carry not only activity but also to disseminate disease. Um, the French rule over Tahiti it meant the dissolution of the tr traditional uh, Tahitian way of life. Uh, uh, and I think Stevenson was extremely critical um, of that in, in his uh, final years. Question, but what is the Eptide really about? Oh, that's a lot, a lot of things. <laughs> I know, it's a lot. Um, it, it's partly, I think, looking towards a tradition that's very, very much established with Joseph Conrad, but I think it anticipates this notion that the Empire is not full of pure blooded white Englishmen with the, you know, the romantic spirit and the heroes and the chivalrous. And they're really out there to help the native people and bring them to the light and all of this kind of thing. I think by the time Stevenson got out to Polynesia and South Seas, he was seeing things that really debunked the whole myth about empire. And the ebb tide is partly about that. Mm. 
he was writing, by the time he got to the Samoa, he was writing political letters to the Times and such like back home about what was happening in Samoa and, and other parts of Polynesia. And he was being criticised by people like Sidney Colvin for spending too much time with what Colvin called his chocolates. Okay. <laughs> and Stevenson wrote back and, you know, is defending them. So he's, he's very much on the, if you like, sympathetic with the native peoples. Yeah. And what, what were Stevenson's politics? <laughs> so, this, is, this isn't easy either, but um, in Claire Harmon's biography, she mm. says, defines Stevenson as a Tory. Yep. And says he always was till the end of his days. So he was an upper middle class Scotsman, so that would be his natural uh, place yeah. to stay in, in politics. His opinions on other issues before he travelled so much were those of a Tory. Um, did he change his mind in general, politically? My PhD student who's working on Stevenson was at Edinburgh the other day and came back to us and said, oh, did you know? I can prove it. Stevenson was a card-carrying Tory. It's his signature okay. was in the book. He was a signed-up Tory. That's so. Uh, out in Samoa, who knows? He may well have changed his politics. Mm -hmm. He may well have done that. But then he was also supposedly an agnostic, and yet later in life he was writing, I think it's some psalms, some hymns, that kind of thing. Yeah. So he's, he's quite... He's quite a dual figure. Jekyll and Hyde. Yes, exactly. All the way through. <laughs> All the way through, right. really about? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's about the evils of colonization, evils of empire building, because uh, the ebb tide has very much to do with the Enid, Virgil's Enid, mm -hmm. 
because it, when you think of it, the, the protagonist is an Enid fiend. He has a, he is a complete destitute, and the only thing he's got left with him is a copy, a, a tattered copy of the Enid. Yeah. And he can quote any part of the Enid uh, just off the cuff. He writes his own epitaph, which is an extract yeah. from the Enid. Uh, anything he looks at, even though he is in the tropics, reminds him of the Enid because he was educated, educated. as yeah. uh, was the case in, in 19th century. You, you knew about the, those the texts, that's yeah. right. But when he looks out at the island we can see out there, Moorea, yeah. what he what comes to his mind is a quote from the Enid. <laughs> when he sails into um, an atoll and sails through the pass, he is reminded of the Enid. And what is the Enid about? It was a text that was commissioned by a Roman emperor in order to uh, justify his position as an emperor and it was uh, laying the foundations of the Roman Empire. In retrospect, this emperor wanted to make sure that his origins went as far back as the original founder, mm -hmm. Aeneas. <laughs> yeah. So the Aeneid is about tracing the origins of this emperor back to Aeneas. And I think that Stevenson, because he knew everything about the Enid, and actually the only book he had with him in Tahiti while he was in Tautira was the Enid and a Latin dictionary. So while he was staying there and getting the feeling of Tahiti, he also was reading and re-reading again and again the Enid. And it may have ended up in writing this, this book uh, because it also takes place in an atoll. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it takes place in Tahiti and on an atoll. And uh, it's about how the first place, Papeete, has been metamorphosed by Western civilization. Yeah. In other words, by empire building. So I think that the first part of the book portrays in a very negative way what a tropical island has become as a result of Western presence. And then the characters sail away and there are many references in the book to the fact that they are sailing back in time to sailing back to the past mm -hmm. because this, this boat they have, the Farallone, the is a repeat of previous voyages that, that were made by Wiseman and Rice Hart, for instance. They, they make the same mistakes, they have the same crew. It's also a repeat of the former uh, boat which uh, the captain had where he drowned people. So you can see that many things refer to the past and it may be extended as far as saying that the Farallone sails back to the past and maybe to the origins of Western settlements in the Pacific because the place they land to in, on this atoll looks very much like early settlements because the, the, the man who lives there is Atwater and he presents himself as having a mission and he, he, he also says that he came for business and obviously he also is a political ruler. Mm -hmm. So he may well be the epitome of the first colonizers yeah. who came for power, political power, economic exploitation, uh, exploitation and mission and religious... Uh, so Atwater's all three in one. I would say he's so. He's the authority, he's reaping the riches and he's imposing the religion. Because he has a pearl farm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I would say that um, it's, a, it's a tale about the making of an empire and having a look at the results first and then sailing back to the sources, see how it was made. 
but always in the background, it seems to me that there's this reference to, to the Aeneid, mm -hmm. because there are lots of, uh, lots of cross-references you can find yeah. in the book itself. So it could be described as an Aeneid of the British Empire? Yes, or except European that it ends in, in a quite different way. The ending is okay, yeah. <laughs> it's quite different. Yeah.